I'm Sharon Squassoni, and I direct the proliferation program here at the Center for Strategic and International Studies. And I have with me today uh, two friends and colleagues, Laura Rockwood, um, who is a senior research fellow at the Harvard Kennedy School, and Ali Heinonen, who is a senior fellow at the Harvard Kennedy School. And we are here in beautiful Tokyo uh, talking about Japan's fuel cycle decisions and the implications for the non-proliferation regime. Both Laura and Ali um, spent many years uh, and accumulated a lot of expertise as experts at the International Atomic Energy Agency. So <clears throat> the issue that we have before us is Japan, which is an advanced nuclear state, used to have a lot of reactors. <laughs> they used to have more than 50 nuclear power reactors. And since the Fukushima Daiichi accident in March 2011, all of them have shut down. But they're left with a lot of infrastructure, and that includes uranium enrichment and spent fuel reprocessing facilities. Um, for the use of nuclear energy, these are important. They're used to make fuel. These technologies are used to make fuel. Um, but they also have a dual purpose. And uh, they can be used to make uh, fissile material for nuclear weapons. Now, Japan is, um, <clears throat> as everyone knows, um, a member of the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty. It has excellent non-proliferation credentials. But uh, the fact that Japan wants to move forward and operate these fuel cycle facilities without any clear path for its nuclear power reactors has raised some questions. So we want to just have a discussion today about what um, some of their, the issues and the options are. Do we need, do we need to worry about this? I mean, Japan is a, a good ally. They've, uh, they're a non-nuclear weapon state. Um, they have a good record over the years. Can you just uh, give us your impression of what, what are some of the issues? What, what's at stake here? First of all, the people have raised concerns about this big plutonium mountain which Japan owns. Here in Japan, there are several tons of separated plutonium, and then Japan has fairly large stocks also in Europe, in France and UK. And the question is that what is the use of plutonium now, in particular when the reactors are shut down and we don't know when they start to operate again. So therefore, I think that uh, one has to explain why you have these materials, what you plan to do with that. Mm -hmm. And I think that this is something which the Japanese government should do very clearly and in a very open, transparent way, mm -hmm. that this is what we have, this is what we plan to do with that. And you know, on certain day from here on, we start perhaps a reprocessing. And the timing need to be also rational and justified. And they haven't done that uh, uh, so far? Not quite. <laughs> they have done a lot of it, but you know, this whole thing has developed with the time. There had been decisions done decades ago that Japan has a fuel cycle, has both fuel cycles, front end fuel cycle to produce enriched uranium for reactor fuel, and at the back end for the spent fuel reprocess, take the plutonium out, take still the enriched uranium, which is still there, mm -hmm. and recycle both and use them as a new fuel for the reactors. And this was on the, from the rosy days of nuclear energy. <laughs> then things didn't go that way. The original idea was to have their uh, so-called fast breeder reactors, which would have consumed this material. But then there were some mishaps and technical troubles. So that part of the program got delayed. And Japan is not alone there. No country really has been able to commercialize these breeder reactors. That's that true. Truth. That's true. There, there are. Uh, activities, particularly in Russia, but uh, not in a big, big scale as people thought in 1960s and 70s, when these first decisions were right. made. Mm -hmm. So uh, Japan was then caught in this, to sit, this situation, and then they had done all the investments. They had reprocessing planters, one in Tokaimura, and then this is Rokkas, which you mentioned. And uh, they had invested, operated, and then came these other changes, and this unfortunate uh, event in uh, Fukushima last year, yeah, which so then put the whole thing on halt. Oh, in and 2011. Yeah. Right. <laughs> so, so that's why we have this plutonium mountain there. Is it, Laura, 
you know, from an industrial viewpoint, as we've heard from some of our Japanese mm -hmm. colleagues, they tend to say this is not a lot of plutonium. But from a non-proliferation, you know, safeguards perspective, it is quite a lot. Can you talk a little bit about that? It's certainly quite a lot of plutonium yeah. by almost anybody's standards. Um, and you asked a question which is a good one. Should we be worried about it? Japan is a country with good non-proliferation credentials. They have an excellent working relationship with the IAEA, uh, with safeguards inspectors. They have additional protocol in place. It's all good, but safeguarding reprocessing facility is one of the most uh, significant technical challenges that exists in safeguards. But the better question is not whether we should be worried, because the agency manages to do those safeguards. The problem is that there is a perception outside of Japan Within the greater Asian community, there are concerns about this large amount of plutonium that doesn't appear to correspond to the industrial needs of Japan. So I think um, the Japanese government and the industry would be wise to do, as Ollie suggested, to be as transparent as possible about the use of this material. Um, there was a discussion that we had yesterday about uh, perhaps um, putting the excess plutonium in the custody of the IAEA. It is something that the IAEA has the statutory authority to do. It wouldn't involve additional costs or movement of plutonium, but it would add to the transparency of the Japanese government and perhaps alleviate some of the concerns within the region about why does Japan need all of that plutonium. How many SQs, even of the nuclear material, the plutonium in Japan, is that, Ollie? Something like nine tons, and if eight kilograms is uh, an SQ, that's an awful lot of SQs, and I can't do the, the math that quickly. But. So an SQ is a significant quantity. Exactly. And the, the to make a simple nuclear device. To make a yeah. simple nuclear yeah. device. But this, so the argument that you'll hear often is, well, that plutonium, it's not very good anyway. It's reactor grade. And if a country really wanted to go a weapons route, they wouldn't use their plutonium from civilian power reactors, because it's very hot, right? And it also has a buildup of certain isotopes that are bad for weapons. What do you say to that argument? Yeah, it's true. You, know, you have to think a couple of scenarios here. If there is a country which is in a tremendous hurry to go for nuclear, then it will use any plutonium they exactly. have. A nuclear weapon. Uh, for <laughs> yeah. nuclear, right. uh, nuclear weapon. But then if you want to maintain such arsenal, this is not the best way to do at all. And therefore, uh, uh, nuclear weapon states, India, China, US, they have produced a very different type of plutonium for weapons purposes. So therefore, you know, the concern here, uh, if you look a kind of nation, nation going, or uh, nation state going to nuclear weapons, you know, I would not be so worried about that big stock of plutonium here. Enrichment might be a bit different here, because mm -hmm. there you can do it uh, tailor-made by using this current enrichment processes to high enrich uranium, which is good for weapons, but that's another story. But then this big quantity of uh, uh, plutonium. Actually, you cannot do this with the small quantities, the recycling, because a reactor like a Kengai or Sendai or any of these light water reactors here in Japan, just the annual fuel load for such a reactor when you use MOX fuel or plutonium fuel, it's five, six hundred kilograms per reactor. So if you have ten reactors, it's five tons per year. And then when you manufacture this fuel, uh, the industry practice is that you uh, you have to manufacture it to pass all the licenses and, and uh, construction permits and all, about two years before that. So in reality, if I want to make fuel for, let's say, two years or three years from now, I need a stock of 10 tons. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, you cannot do it. 10 and tons of, of plutonium, plutonium yeah. to make this mixed oxide yeah. fuel, which for is ten what, reactors. for 10 reactors, which yeah, Japan if, wants yeah to do. if I want to do it an old, orderly way, and right. with the license, those who give you license, keep. And this is not understood. And I think this is where I think 
Japanese utilities, perhaps I may a little bit fail to explain to the general right. public, particularly outside of Japan. So, so this goes back to my question about from an industrial perspective, there is a rationale for keeping tons of separated plutonium around to make this fuel, right? So you would keep for 10 reactors, and Japan used to have more than 50, if you were going to fuel them with MOX fuel, you would want to keep on hand about 10 tons. And that is what Japan actually has here domestically. Today, yeah. Yeah. What do they do with the 37 tons <laughs> that are in France and the UK? Yeah, is is that just going to sit around for yeah. a while? Yeah, it's going to sit around for, an, for a while. And this is another dilemma. Because that plutonium which is there, it's in a powder. And some of it is actually plutonium oxide. It's not yet even mixed oxide. So some of it is in France, where there's a fuel fabrication. So in principle, the best way would be to make that one to a fuel and then ship it to Japan when it's ready. Mm -hmm. There can be some commercial uh, you know, interest who is making cheaper or that. But then the UK one, I think, poses an additional problem because Two things. I don't think that the United Kingdom has an operating MOX fabrication plant today. Mm -hmm. Plus that, if I remember correctly, part of that is plutonium oxide. So you first you need to mix it with uranium to get this mixed oxide and then manufacture the fuel. But the United Kingdom uh, companies don't have the capability to do it. So here you have an additional dilemma with that how you deal with that. And I don't think it's also a good idea to ship it to Japan because shipping this kind of uh, material which is in oxide form is less safe and you know, there are security concerns and other things. So th there are a couple of dilemmas here what Japan has and has to solve and explain to people why we can't take this one, why it is more reasonable at this stage to produce fuel in Japan and not in the United Kingdom. Maybe a few years from now they can do it there. Right, so from the outside perspective, I mean, J Japan has a lot of challenges to overcome in the nuclear sector. I mean, the number one thing is restarting reactors. Um, and there are a lot of complex legal and economic and political decisions there, and public opinion is not very supportive of nuclear energy right now. but. <clears throat> that whole set of issues is quite different from the things that we worry about on the outside, which is we've had a series of nuclear security summits. Japan is basically has this big stockpile of plutonium with nowhere to go. There are no reactors to operate. And it's not something that a lot of other countries want to use. They can't simply sell this plutonium. So, you know, Laura was suggesting, and um, you also suggested a few things, uh, or a few ways in which Japan could increase its transparency, in which it could provide some kind of assurance to not just the United States, really, that's less of an issue, but to its neighbors, neighbors. really. Um, to South Korea, to China. China was quite critical of uh, Japan and the fact that there was not just this reactor grade plutonium, but weapons grade plutonium sitting around in research facilities. Can you talk a little bit about that, this announcement uh, at the last nuclear security summit? Yeah, that has been there uh, for years. And this is part of the history of Japanese nuclear program. When they were looking at these fast breeder reactors, they had to have have uh, research facilities to, deal for, to support the design of these reactors. So therefore, you had things which are called critical assemblies, where you can simulate certain uh, you know, uh, neutron fluxes and things like that. And in order to do that, uh, one used plutonium, which has a uh, different isotopic composition, which is closer to nuclear weapons uh, mm -hmm. category type of material, plus used high enriched uranium for the similar experiments. And now one doesn't need any more that science. That's history. They have done everything what they can study, in my view. Mm -hmm. So uh, now I, I understand that uh, 
they have agreed between US and Japan that this will be repatriated. Mm -hmm. So that is the problem over mm -hmm. in that sense. And I don't think the Japanese people are that much worried about that plutonium stock over there. They are probably worried about the spent fuel. Mm -hmm. What to do with the spent fuel? To reprocess it? Now we are in a situation here in Japan that when the reactors stop and we have the old uranium stocks, even if this Rokkasomura starts as some people expect it starts, still the inventory of spent fuel grows in Japan. Mm -hmm. So there are hard decisions to be made in a country that what they want to do with the long term. There's a sense that Japan is just going to continue going down this track that it started on, you know, the train left the station 40 years ago. Yeah, that's true. And it's just too hard to change course or to get off on another track. I think there are a couple of dynamics that are working here, and one is the sheer amount of money that's been invested in this whole process that goes from reprocessing to MOX fuel, et cetera, um, what they call sunken, sunk costs. Mm -hmm. you know? um, one of the colleagues we spoke with yesterday talked about instead of emphasizing sunk costs, we should consider future costs. You can't recover what you put in there, but you can look ahead to see what would be the cost of going forward with a much bigger reprocessing program or uranium enrichment program or that sort of thing. It's also complicated by the factor of the states of Japan's commitment to the various prefectures, uh, the, the prefecture in which Wakasho reprocessing plant is, is situated. They've made certain promises to the community as to, uh, in terms of uh, security of jobs in terms of what they will or will not do with spent fuel. And I think if they are going to switch gears, uh, which many people think they should, um, it's going to require an incredible amount of renegotiation of the, the deals that exist. You have utilities that own the material. You have the government that has vested interests. It's just, it's just not an easy black and white situation for the government of Japan. And, um, so I think the, the financial uh, commitments and the, the commitments to the communities in which they've constructed these nuclear facilities are probably some of the most mm -hmm. difficult things. And also struggling with the perception on the part of some that Japan has an ulterior motive in acquiring all this additional uh, plutonium. There are rational industrial needs. It, you know, the, the, it is being appropriately safeguarded. But the region is such that um, Japan's a, a front runner. I mean, they're, they're a key nuclear player in the region. Mm -hmm. And people are looking at what are they doing to be responsible from the point of view of safety, security, and nonproliferation. The actions they take, everybody is watching. Everybody is watching. Exactly. And one of the things I always worry about is <clears throat> what, what are the precedents mm -hmm. that are set? And, and there seems to be an issue that we never really resolve in the nonproliferation community, and that is sovereignty, the sovereign mm -hmm. right of countries to make these decisions about their fuel cycle and the nonproliferation impact. We see this very clearly with Iran, uh, although that's somewhat of a special case mm -hmm. because they violated their, their safeguards and their treaty um, commitments, but um, the, the question is, you know, a country can always say, well, why do I have to do more? <laughs> and Japan has certainly done a lot, right? It's got state-of-the-art safeguards on Rakasho. It does a lot of, it, it complies with the international plutonium management guidelines. But it's not about what have I done and aren't I in good standing. It's a question of what could I do more? Wouldn't it be in my national interest to resolve some of these insecurities that the neighbors have or the world community has? Change the narrative. Stop thinking about it as, I don't see why I should have to do that because I'm in good standing, but rather establishing a higher norm, a, a better standard. Um, choosing as a matter of national sovereignty to do something different, to change course or to be more transparent. It's, 
I, I think changing the narrative is really important. Instead of looking at it as a burden, rather looking at it as an opportunity to go one step more, mm -hmm. to, to do more because it's in your national interest, not in spite of the fact of your sovereignty. Right. You know, there's a one, also I think people have a little bit uh, wrong illusions here with regard to the plutonium. So you said train has left the station and you know, it's a very, when you drive with a train, you cannot change the tracks. They are what <laughs> they are. So now the only way really to, uh, is to build a new track or, or stop, stop at the station. <laughs> but you stop at station, but you have one problem. You have 10 tons of plutonium. What you do with that cake? Yeah. And uh, I know, you know, some of my professor friends in the uh, US say that, you know, you dispose it as a waste. So you bury it underground. Yeah. yeah. Can you know they how, do that in Japan? Yes, you can, but it will take about tw maybe 15, 20 years to okay. develop the technology. Right. Because there is no technology today, let's be honest. Right, but you never get away from the need to bury something, something yeah, <laughs> in whatever the, form. It's either right. high-level waste or plutonium in but glass high, blocks. High-level waste, you are a little bit better off because there is already a process there. Ah. So the uh, Rokkasomura has quite a lot of high-level waste. This has been immobilized. Mobilized. There is not yet a place where to put it, which is another right. other trouble. Yeah. They are on their, you know, many of its government has to solve all the utilities. Is Japan doing enough on that back, the back end of the back end, as we say? I think that they, so if I were them, I would look also a little bit more of these other alternatives because maybe this rosy future, which was not in 1960s, is not entirely there. <laughs> so y you do what you do with the current stocks, then you think what you do with the, some of the rest. But I think in a big picture, if they go back to, you know, tens of nuclear reactors operating, I think that spent fuel, direct disposal, and long-term storage is, needs some more attention, at least. And there I have not seen much of, a, much of a research, particularly for the direct disposal. We could say the same of the U.S. and most other you countries. Know, don't do it. as I do, but as I teach. <laughs> exactly. So we're and running. Can I say one more? Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> there is these countries which are very, you know, loud saying, of, talking about the nuclear problem of Japan and plutonium stocks. They mostly, are the ones. Mostly China. Yeah. <laughs> they are producing all the time plutonium. They have their own plutonium. They plan to use it for civilian purposes. So I think that they should perhaps do the same creative thinking as they asked Japan to do that. Do they really need to have it? Mm -hmm. That is also something which should be brought to debate, but that's another story. Well, the U.S., you know, the U.S. policy, which is very unpopular, is that you don't need reprocessing to have a successful nuclear energy program, mm -hmm. that you can simply dispose of the fuel. But we keep running up against this sovereignty issue, which is countries say, don't tell us what to do, we can make our own decisions. Yeah, and NPT is very clear. What is not forbidden Pretty. is allowed, and allowed. this is not forbidden. Right, exactly. So, and uh, I think that's, that's where we are. Uh, but I think maybe spending more resources everywhere in terms of uh, what you can do with spent fuel, you know, is there a safe way of reusing the residual energy instead of just burrowing, <laughs> burying? Um, this is an energy resource as well. So are we doing enough in terms of R&D to try to figure out a better way of safely and securely maximizing the use of that energy? Maybe not reprocessing. Maybe our scientists need to we need to be spending more energy in trying to develop effective uses of, of this as a, as a resource um, yeah. rather than just oh, throwing right. it away. Look, you know. Any last uh, comments, things that I think we there are ways to um, find ways to store this material safely and securely and give ourselves time to come up with a better solution. I mean, who would have thought technologically we'd be where we are today in many areas? What's to think that we can't, with a little bit of imagination and a lot of focus and some extra money, uh, start, start putting our, our academic and industrial research efforts 
into that. Maybe we can start thinking these things, thinking about these things in a, in a different way. Lauren Ali, thank you so much for your time today. Thanks for your ideas, and uh, we'll look forward to what happens with Japan's nuclear energy in the future. Thanks, Thanks for having, having us. us. Thanks. It's been a pleasure. Thank you.